uh, marriage at all. It is um, a false marriage. And this is what the enemy has always done, as he has always sought to mimic and copy what God set up from the very beginning when the devil, when he was known as Lucifer, from the very beginning, he, um, the scripture says, he was lifted up in pride within himself. He said, uh, I, I will ascend to the sides of the north. I will be like the most high. Uh, he sought to mimic everything that God has, uh, had done. For, every, for God, there is a false God. For true marriage, there is fake marriage. Uh, for uh, Jesus, who was God manifested in the flesh, you will have the Antichrist, who will be uh, the devil manifested in the flesh. And so the enemy has sought to mimic everything that God does. Uh, and this is why we ought to be very careful with the things that we uh, involve ourselves in because the devil is a master manipulator. He is a master trickster. Uh, he is a, a master uh, uh, illusionist, if you will. Uh, we ought to be very careful concerning the things that we uh, allow ourselves to become entangled with because if you don't have the level of discernment and the understanding uh, that you need, you can be fooling around with the devil and not even know it. And it is a very serious thing. This is why I don't listen to secular music because the devil is all in secular music. Uh, I don't care how harmless uh, the rhymes may seem to be. Uh, the enemy is in secular music. And, of course, when he was Lucifer... Um, in, uh, in the abode of God, in heaven itself, uh, he was the minister of music. He was the one that arranged uh, the worship. And so he knows a little something about the impact of music. And of course, he, because he has now fallen from his position, and he is the adversary, the enemy of God, uh, he is going to use every tool that he can to destroy man and specifically to destroy those that have given their lives over to him. That's why many Christians don't see any, anything wrong with listening to uh, secular music. But I want you to understand what it is doing in you. It is planting seeds of doubt. It is planting seeds of defiance. It is planting seeds of rejection in the heart of the individual. Uh, for a person that says, I don't see anything wrong. Well, Music that is not inspired by God carries with it an influence. It carries with it a spirit. And don't you understand that uh, spirits are there to influence our behavior? They're there to influence our thinking and influence our behavior. And uh, one of the things that we do now as we fall asleep with headphones on, music that is being pumped into our head, listening to that all night long, just providing an entrance for the enemy uh, into our psyche and into our mind. And then we wonder why we think the thoughts that we think. We wonder why we can't seem to get our lives together. We wonder why uh, we have the difficulty that we have. We wonder why we deal with the anger that we deal with. We wonder why we uh, go through some of the things that we go through, and all along, it is the influence, it is the spirit that we have been playing into our lives uh, unwittingly, uh, not knowing that the enemy... Now, uh, now, I have to tell you, because Paul said um, uh, in the book of 1 Corinthians, uh, unless lest Satan should get an advantage over us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Satan has some devices or he devises or he plans or he plots. He works years in advance, months in advance because he knows how he wants to destroy you. And so what he does is he plans and he sets it up. He puts people in our lives. He allows us, he uses the music that we, that we listen to. He knows exactly how to set us up for destruction. And so what my responsibility is as the preacher 
is to warn you uh, concerning the plan of the enemy. It's to warn you so that you can understand that the devil is trying to take you out. Some people say, oh, who that think, preacher think he is trying to tell me what to do? You don't have to listen. <laughs> you can do whatever you want to do. I'm just trying to help you to be saved. I have no interest uh, in controlling anybody's life. Uh, my only interest is trying to help somebody to be saved. And um, the fact of the matter is, is that uh, all of us need a preacher, even, even myself. Uh, I'm not exempt from that. I have a preacher over me. Uh, I have bishops over me that I go to uh, to help keep me straight. Uh, and so it is my responsibility uh, to, to help us to understand how the enemy, what he is devising against us because he wants to destroy us. Can we say amen? And, and I'll tell you another tactic and the trick the enemy uses is deceit. He uses uh, the subtlety that is in, uh, in uh, deceit. And he has been using this since the Garden of Eden uh, to try and deceive us into believing that what we are doing is all right when the fact is what we are doing violates the word of God. He used deception to trick Eve to make her think that what she was doing in eating uh, and partaking of the fruit, he tricked her because the desire was to be like God. And the enemy tricked Eve to make her believe that if you eat the fruit, you are going to be like God. Because he, he said unto her, God knows that in the day that you eat is thereof, you are going to be like God's. And in the mind of Eve, she believed that this, is, this would expedite the process of being like God. And so he tricked her. He deceived her. That's why the scripture says Eve being deceived. But Adam wasn't deceived. Adam knew exactly what he was doing. Eve gave him that fruit. The scripture says he ate, he took of it, and he did eat. He wasn't tricked. He knew exactly what he was doing. But the enemy used deception. And he uses deception, that same form, that same level of deception. He uses that even now, uh, even in our day. It is, he is, uh, it is more complex now. Uh, and it is, he has disguised it and dressed it up uh, in such a way now uh, that uh, folks can't tell what is right and what is wrong. This is why it's so important to be taught, uh, because teaching will help us to understand the difference between right and wrong. Teaching will help us to understand. You may say, well, well preacher, I already know right and wrong. My mother and my father taught me right and wrong. The, the level of understanding that we were taught was faulty, because we were taught right and wrong. Uh, by, uh, of, of course, albeit by our, our parents or guardians, those who had the best intentions, uh, those who wanted to rear us up and, and teach us how to be good, productive members of society. But that level of understanding of right and wrong was faulty because it was informed by the fallen nature. There is a higher standard that we must ascribe to, and that is the righteousness of God. What God determines to be right, what God determines to be wrong. Because right and wrong now don't mean what they, uh, right and wrong 25 years ago uh, doesn't mean what it means now. Now they say it's all right for a, uh, a little boy to uh, put on some lipstick, wear a skirt, and some fishnet stockings, and call himself a girl. They say now that that is all right. They say now that it is wrong for you uh, to discipline your child. I was talking to someone today and uh, uh, talking about it. Uh, I, I spanked my son and the teacher said that I, there, she was going to call CPS on me. Oh, it's, it's wrong now to discipline it. She said, what do you expect me to do? I'm not going to have it to where he's 16 years old and he's beating me up. I'm going to put it on him now. I, I said, you go ahead. <laughs> but that's wrong now. Uh, and so even our understanding of right and wrong 
uh, that we were taught was faulty because it was informed by the fallen nature, which, is a bit, which has been infected by sin. The fallen nature is infected. Uh, and so when God saves us, now we come into a greater understanding of what right is. We come into a greater understanding of what wrong is. We come into the understanding, we come into the knowledge of God. And if we live our lives in accordance to the knowledge of God that we know and understand, you will do that which is right. You will do that which is wrong. You will be criticized for the way that you live by the world who says that it's all right uh, to, to identify yourself as transgender. You will be criticized. But that's all right because blessed are ye when men shall revile you and say all manner of evil against you falsely, as Jesus said, rejoice for your name is written in heaven. Can we say amen? And so this is, what, uh, this is why it's good to uh, be in Bible class. All right, let us go now back to the fifth chapter of the book of Matthew. And we are going to uh, uh, continue our lesson here for it's 7.45, about 35 minutes. We're going to continue our lesson into the, uh, the Beatitudes. And uh, I am uh, happy we are, we are making progress. Uh, we have gone through the first four, uh, but we're going to recap tonight. And then on Tuesday night, Lord willing, we will get into the fifth Beatitude, uh, which is blessed are the merciful. And the reason why we want to do it in that regard uh, is because of the, uh, the first four Beatitudes is what sets you up for the last four. There are eight Beatitudes. The first four is what sets you up for the last four. And you cannot accomplish the, last, the second half or the, the last four until you have first come into, understood, and mastered the first four. And the first four Beatitudes has to do with, has to, uh, uh, encompasses the individual that has now come into salvation, the attitude that we must have in coming into salvation, the attitude that we must have in being saved. The first four covers my entry into the body of Christ and the, dis, the mental disposition, the attitude that I must have if I am going to be like God. As I told you, you must think of the Beatitudes as a staircase that I am stepping on the other, stepping on the next. And of course, you can't skip a step because you're trying to speed up the process. It doesn't work like that. You have to take it one step at a time if I am going to ascend from the depths of sin and despair and ascend up this staircase to accomplish the measure, the stature, the fullness of Christ, if I am going to be like God, it is a process that is a step-by-step -step walk with God. You can't speed up the process. As I gave you the analogy uh, that I am not a very good cook, I can cook certain things, um, breakfast, but if it, if it requires instruction and deep thought, if there's, if there's some philosophy behind it, uh, Brother Giovanni, you can count me out. Um, if it's eggs, I can, I can cook some eggs, and I get creative. I'll throw some shrimp in them eggs uh, and some vegetables. I'll get creative. Um, but if it's something that requires uh, more involvement, then I'll sit on the sidelines. Uh, if I, I'm not a very good baker either, Brother Chris, um, because of my impatience when it comes to enjoying uh, uh, the snack that I am baking. And there is a cost to speeding up the process. Uh, if the cookies call for 18, 16 to 18 minutes, at 375, I'll crank the oven to 450 uh, and, and hoping that they'll be done in eight minutes. But the problem is, is that it might be done on the outside, but on the inside is, is, is not done. That's because it takes time to cook. And you won't know until you, and if you've never bit into a 
doughy biscuit. It is a terrible thing. And you can't, and don't think that you're going to take it out the oven, recognize it's not done on the inside, and then stick it back in. Oh, no, it's because now you're going to burn it. You're going to ruin it. You've got to start all over. What's the point? The point is, is that we cannot rush the process because we may look the part on the outside, but on the inside, we are still doughy. On the inside, we're not done. That's because it takes time to be what God has called us to be. Can we say amen? Amen. God bless you. Matthew chapter number 5, and let us read verses number 1 through verse 5. If we have it, can we say amen? Amen. God bless you. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, they shall inherit the earth. Verse 6, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. That term filled means satisfied. Now, remember, it is a staircase. And the first step is blessed are the poor in spirit. And now just to recap, poor in spirit. Poor means that I am destitute. It means that I am depraved. It means that I am empty. It means that there is a poverty. It, I am poverty stricken. My spirit is poverty stricken. It means that I am devoid of everything that I need in order to walk with God. It means that I don't possess anything that God can use that will be of any eternal value or any eternal benefit. I am empty and I have nothing. Being, being poor means that I am lacking. It means that I am in want. It means that I need something. And this is the first step because it is in recognition of my condition. I cannot be filled if I don't see that I am empty, I cannot get from God what he has for me if I, if I take the position that I don't need something from God. If I don't recognize that I am poor, that I am depraved, that I am lacking, that I do not possess, then I cannot get by contrast, what the scripture says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I cannot get the contrast, and the contrast is the kingdom of heaven. I cannot get, uh, the kingdom of heaven has to do with the construct of the church. All that God has through the church. I cannot get the riches that come from God if I don't recognize that I need something. And this is the first stage, the first step in change, if you will, because if I don't see a need, then I will not desire the, uh, that which God has for me. I cannot change if I don't see the need to change. I cannot receive from God if I don't see the need for what he has for me. And this is, this is the first step, and many people cannot get beyond it because they think because based on their religious experiences that they know something. You don't know anything. They think because I have been to this church and that church and been exposed to this preacher and that preacher that I know something, you don't know anything. And until you recognize, until you acknowledge that you don't know anything, then God cannot pour into you the riches that come through the kingdom of heaven. As I gave you an example, as I was sitting there with uh, a PhD scientist from Dow Chemical, and he was telling me about his uh, travels across the world leading teams for Dow Chemical and how he has led Bible studies at mega churches and so forth and so on, and now he wants to come into the jail uh, and do the same thing. And I, and I let him know that you, uh, all of the 
accomplishments are, um, uh, should be lauded. But when you come into the jail, they need more than just teaching. When you come into the jail, they need to be ministered to. The suicide, the person that is grappling in the throes of suicide needs to be ministered to. The young man who is where he is because of what happened to him in his life when he was a child and he is trying to understand why he keeps doing what he is doing because he is running from and avoiding and no one has been able to provide context for him what has happened to him. He needs more than just your knowledge. He needs ministry. The young lady that has subjected herself to abuse because of how she views herself and feels about her. She needs ministry through the love of God. And he says, I am not capable of that. And I appreciated him saying that because it was an acknowledgement that I don't possess that because now I can do something with that. Now I can teach you. Now I can help you. And when a person comes off of their pride, and allows themselves to be humbled under the mighty hand of God, that is how you get the help of God. That is how you get the ministry of God. That is how you get the remedy for your messed up condition is when you recognize I am messed up. It doesn't have anything to do with my religious experiences. It has nothing to do with my religious exposures. It has nothing to do with who is... Uh, what bishop has spoken into my life, what prophetess has prophesied in my life, I must recognize that right now I have nothing for my, to resolve my own condition. And until you do that, you will never get the help of God. And so the scripture says, Jesus said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Verse number four, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now, we oftentimes use this scripture uh, in times of great sorrow when someone loses a loved one, uh, uses at, a, at the funeral, uh, and certainly it is appropriate and uh, there is some application there. But the mourning here has to do with, I now, because I now recognize my condition, because I now recognize that I am empty, because I now recognize that I am devoid of everything that I need for my eternal salvation. Because I recognize that now I am in mourning or now I am in deep anguish, deep sorrow because of my condition. And this mourning, this recognition of my condition is what produces repentance. It, it, is, it produces a sense of God, I need your help. I am, I am messed up. I have messed up. And I want to change. I want to be better. I want to stop doing. This is what repentance is all about. Repentance is a change of mind. It is a change of heart. It, te it tells God, whatever I have been yesterday, today, I am ready to be something different. Today, I am ready to walk with you. Today, I am ready to give my life to you. And when there is the mourning, as the scripture says, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. For they shall be comforted. The comfort comes from the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost. So blessed are they that out of their Recognition of their poor, depraved, empty, lost condition. They now are turning to God and crying out to God because they are messed up. Now that they are crying out to God, now they shall be comforted with the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, or they can now receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost because they see themselves and they change. Repentance is a change of mind. You can't talk repentance. It has got to be, a, you have to be resolved in your heart to change. There has to be activity. 
behind my attitude. There has to be behavior behind what my talk, what I am saying. Talk is cheap, as they say. Um, but show me, show God that we mean business by actually doing what we say we want to do. Well, let me help you to understand. Let's go to uh, the, uh, the, uh, the book of Isaiah, chapter number 55 and verse number 7. You cannot get the comfort or you will not be comforted or you cannot get the comforter until there is mourning, there is an anguish, there is a deep sorrow, there is a crying out to God based on what I understand about myself, based on the preacher that has showed me the contrast of God and me, that God is this, he is on one end of the spectrum, and me in my messed up condition are on the other end of the spectrum. Based on that contrast, now I am anguished about my condition. I am in deep sorrow about what I am, and now I am ready to turn from that. And this is what I love about God. When we turn, he is the first one there to help us. When we are ready to stop, ready to change, God is the first one there to our rescue. And indeed, this is what he has promised us. He has promised. If you stop, if you be resolved to stop, I will be there to pick you up. He has promised us that. And so now I am faced with the God who fulfills his promise. I am now confronted with the God who is beckoning me, compelling me to change. Because it's one thing to know what I am. It's another thing to do something about it. And this is the individual that is poor in spirit, but is now mourning, that is now resolved to change. Isaiah 55 and verses number 7. Let's pick it up in verse number 6. If we have it, can we say amen? All right. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Now, often when I deal with this verse, I often share that this, the first time I read this verse, this was a very terrifying verse to me. And the reason why is the scripture says, seek ye the Lord while he may be found. That means that there is a time when God can be found and there's a time where he will not be found. And it is up to us to seek him while he may be found. He is found because he is seeking us. He is found because he is standing at the door of our heart knocking. Even tonight, God is knocking. What do, you, what do you want, Jesus? I want you to let me in. I want to come in and sup with you and you with me and have fellowship with you and you with me. What is that? He wants to give you the Holy Ghost. He wants to save your life. He is knocking. He can be found tonight. The scripture says, seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. That suggests to us that there is a time where God is near and there's a time where he will be far away from us. And there's nothing worse than feeling that God is far away from you. Feeling that when I pray, he's not even listening. That when I try to get help, he is nowhere to be found. There's a, there's a terrible place to be in. Verse number seven, let us read. Let the wicked forsake his way. Now, he helps us to understand what it means to seek him while he, is, while he may be found, to call upon him while he is near. This is how you seek him. This is how you call upon him. Verse number seven. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him 
and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. This is the very definition of mourning. This is the very definition of repentance. Let the wicked forsake his way. If you are going to be comforted, you have got to forsake your ways. That's just the way that I am. I, that's just me. I'm just going to do me. That's just how I am. You know what? That's the problem. Just how I am got me where I am. Just how I am is the reason why I need God. And it is not enough to turn from my ways. The scripture says, let the wicked, first of all, let the wicked. First of all, I've got to understand exactly what I am. That I am poor in spirit. That I am wicked. And until a person understands that they are wicked, they will not see a need to forsake their ways. Because they won't see anything wrong with their ways. Until I understand. We try to help young men all the time. If you would just admit what you are, then God can help you. But if you won't admit what you are, then you will hide behind the cloak of your fake righteousness. Because you are, trying to, you are pretending to be something that you are not. And God does not fool with pretenders. This is why he told Adam, where are you? Or in other words, come out from hiding. God cannot do anything for pretenders. This is not a Halloween party when it comes to God. It's not a costume party. Let the wicked first admit that they are wicked. <laughs> All right? So now that I understand that I am wicked, now that I, can under, now that I see my condition, I can now forsake my way. And not just turn from my ways. Not just, as some people say, I'm trying to change my ways. God doesn't want you to just change your ways. He don't want you to do anything with those ways other than forsake them. And the term forsake means to abandon. It means to leave it right there and go in the opposite direction. Don't even look back. That's what forsake means. So when people say, oh, I, I want to change my ways. God says, I don't want you to change your ways. I don't want you to do anything with your ways. The only thing I want you to do is forsake them. Put them down and leave them right where they are. Now, what does that mean? It means that if I want to walk with God, I've got to stop lying. It means that if I want to receive the Holy Ghost, I have got to see the need. I've got to understand that I'm messed up. It means that while I am seeking the Holy Ghost, I am done with the wickedness that I did. If I am really ready to change, if I am really ready to walk in the destiny and the plan of God for my life, then I, there are some things that are not like God that I've got to leave them alone. Otherwise, I cannot get the comfort. Let the wicked forsake his way. And the unrighteous, see there it is again. I've got to confront myself. The unrighteous man. Oh, I'm a good person. You can be a good person but still be unrighteous. Because this unrighteousness is not the unrighteousness of man. This is the unrighteousness of God. And so, the, and I mean the unrighteousness of God. What I mean is that in comparison or in contrast to the righteousness of God, my best efforts at righteousness are unrighteous with God because it doesn't compare. And so giving to charity doesn't make, is not a reflection of, of, of the righteousness of God. Giving, doing good deeds, that is not what is going to get a person the pardon of sins that the verse talks about. Pardoning of sins does not come by way of giving to charity helping someone when they're down. That is not how you get the forgiveness of sin. How you forget the forgiveness of sin is you recognize that the best that I can do is unrighteousness with God and that I am unrighteous. Well, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. So first we dealt with our ways. Now the scripture deals with our thoughts. 
What's wrong with my thoughts, Lord? They are unrighteous. What's wrong with my ways, God? They are wicked. I want to be comforted. Well, if you want to be comforted, you need to put down those ways and you need to forsake those thoughts, the way that I have been thinking. Even the way that I have been thinking about myself, whether it is good or bad, I still need to put those thoughts down. Oh, I am anointed. You, no, you're not. You're wicked and ungodly, but you can be anointed. Oh, God has plans for me. He most certainly does. But everybody understands plans don't always work out. I love it when a good plan comes together. So does God. But his plans don't always work out because an individual will not yield to his plans. And so, yes, he does have plans. But his plans are through the forsaking of your ways and the forsaking of your thoughts. This is repentance. And this is how you get the mercy of God. And he will uh, 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 let the wicked forsake his way, the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord. Let him turn. Return. Let him get back to that place that God created him to be in but was thwarted by Adam. And so now we have got to return back to God. And how we do that is through repentance. Because now that we are turning to God and we are turning away from what we have been, how we have been thinking, we are now turning, making an about face and turning ourselves to God. Now that I am face to face with God, he has something for me. And that is the comfort or the comforter. Let him uh, return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him. Now the mercy is more than just God not rewarding us that which we do deserve. In the mercy of God is his compassion. And as a part of his compassion, compassion is an offshoot of empathy. It means that I have that, because it's very different from sympathy. You look at someone and you sympathize with them. That's just a feeling. Empathy means I, I feel what you feel. I have been in your shoes. Compassion motivates me. It moves me to help you. God's mercy is a reflection of his compassion to us. And his compassion is informed by the fact that he was in our shoes as a man. And so the scripture says, have we not an high priest who cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin? God cloaked himself in flesh so that he can identify, among other things, so that he can identify with, with man on his level. And now he can provide the mercy because I have been where you have been, yet without sin. And we'll, we'll dig into that as we get into blessed are the merciful. But the scripture says, and he will have mercy upon him. God will spare me. He will spare my wickedness. He will spare my unrighteousness because I have turned from that and I have forsaken it. And, uh, and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. And the term pardon has to do with his forgiveness. He will abundantly forgive because my wickedness and my unrighteousness have been abundant. It is overflowing. But God has overflowing mercy and he has overflowing forgiveness. This is the morning. And it comes when I change. It comes when I am resolved to change. Blessed are they that mourn, that they shall be comforted. Well, back in Matthew chapter number 5, blessed are they, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. We dealt with that on last Tuesday. This has to do with uh, the individual. That is teachable. Because now that I have recognized my condition, now that I have repented, 
Now that I have been comforted or now that I have received the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, now I must be teachable because uh, I recognize, and of course, all of these qualities, these attitudes, I must continue to carry with me as I am ascending the staircase. I still recognize that even though I have the Holy Ghost, I still need more. I need more understanding of God. I need more of the knowledge of God. I still, uh, uh, I'm still crying out for God. I am crying out for more of him. Now that I am saved, if I am going to get more of the God, and I use that term relatively because you can't get more of God himself. You got all of God he was going to give you when you got the Holy Ghost, but we can understand him more. We can gain more insight more understanding into him and his word as we are taught. But it will not happen until there is a meekness about us. That, that is a teachableness. Meekness is not weakness. It is a humility. It is a, uh, I am humbling myself. I am bringing myself into a place of submission. I am subjecting myself to be controlled by God not by the pastor, to be controlled by the Holy Ghost. To, I am submitting myself to the order of God that is through his church. There is a teachableness, and I believe it all comes together beautifully. Because if I am teachable, if I am humble, if I am willing to be taught, willing to come under the submission willing to subject myself to the order of God, then the scripture says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And this phrase, inherit the earth, this has to do with the sum total of the fulfillment of the promises of God for me. That can only, and that is through his word. And so that can only happen when I am exhibiting an attitude of teachableness. I am ready now, now that I recognize my condition, now that I have cried out to God, now that I have been comforted, now that I have the Holy Ghost, I am ready now to be taught. And until I am ready to be taught, then you cannot move on to the next step, which is in verse number six. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. If I am not willing to be taught, then there will be no hunger. If I am not willing to be taught, then there will be no thirst. But if I am willing to be taught, if I am willing to humble myself, to bring myself down so that I can gain from God the wisdom, the knowledge, the insight that I need in order to grow, he feeds me. Because the scripture says in the book of Psalms that he shall teach the meek. How does he teach the meek? He teaches the meek through the order of God, through his church. For I will give you pastors after mine own heart who shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. This is how it is done. And now that I am willing to be taught, he teaches me, he feeds me, he feeds my hunger. And the more of God I understand and know, the hungrier I get, the thirstier I get. And he doesn't leave my hunger and leave my thirst unquenched and unsatisfied. The scripture says, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. God will satisfy my appetite. If I submit, to my, submit myself in being teachable. And so now you see how each beatitude stands on the next. And I must possess the first before I can move to the second. And I must possess the second before I can move to the third. And I must possess the third before I can move to the fourth. And so now you've got the first four. Poor in spirit, mourning, meekness, hunger and thirsting after righteousness. This now is the setup for the second half of the Beatitudes, which are... The, uh, the second half of the Beatitudes are a, a reflection 
of the character of God. I cannot accomplish the character of God until I first repent, until he fills me with the Holy Ghost, until I want to be taught, and until he starts teaching me. Now I am ready to, I am prepared to produce fruit. The first four Beatitudes is, consists of the root. The last four is the fruit. And God has now prepared me to bear fruit. And that's what these last four have to do with. And we will get into, uh, we'll start to get into them, Lord willing, on Tuesday night with verse number seven. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. So I wanted to provide for you a um, synopsis of the, the first four Beatitudes. Uh, and I think it is, it was, I believe it was necessary for us to have an understanding because now we want to move on to the last four, but we want to be clear about what God expects from us uh, in preparing to be more and more like him. Amen? Amen. God bless you. We'll go ahead and close it on that note. Are there any questions tonight? Any questions? Uh, all right. Hopefully it was uh, clear and uh, pristine. Uh, before we close, let us go, uh, let us read one scripture uh, with respect to meekness. That is in James chapter number one. I don't think we read this on, uh, on uh, Tuesday night. James chapter number one. The book of James chapter number one. And, well, we did read this, but uh, we didn't read as much as I wanted to read. So we'll read verses number 21 down through verse number 25. James chapter 1, verse 21 through 25, and then we'll read this and then we'll close. Amen. God bless you. If we have it, can we say amen? All right, let us read. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. Lay it apart, that is, lay it aside. All filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, that is, an overflowing of wickedness. Lay it aside and receive with meekness. Receive with humility. Receive with an attitude of being teachable. I am ready to receive the engrafted word. It is engrafted because I'm ready now to receive it. And God will engraft it in me. He will fuse it with my spirit. Receive the, with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. Verse 22. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own self. Oh yes, it's not enough to just hear it. We may, it's not enough to just come to Bible class. It's a good start. But you have to be resolved to actually do the word of God that you have now heard. If you have received it. Some people don't receive it. They hear it, but they don't receive it. They hear it, but they fight it. Oh, I ain't doing that. Oh, I don't agree with that. They hear it, but they won't receive it. And because they won't receive it, there will be no action. They will not do it. Well, if we are going to have this experience the saving of our souls we are going to have to receive it and not only receive it be ye doers of the word but not hearers only deceiving your own selves how can one deceive them on, dece deceive themselves they would deceive themselves by thinking that hearing is enough because remember there are four conditions of the heart Jesus told the parable that's the sower remember the parable the sower went forth to sow so the seed, some fell upon stony ground, some fell among the thorns, some fell upon, uh, among good ground, some fell by the wayside. Everybody's not here to receive it. If I am going to receive it, then I've got to protect it because the enemy wants to come in and steal it out of my heart. Um, deceiving your own selves. Hearing is not enough. Verse 22, for if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face and a glass that is a mirror. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. That is, if we are hearers only, 
when you hear the word of God, it shows you yourself. The word of God is a mirror that shows you how you look in the sight of God. And if we are just hearers, then we will come to church, see how we look in the sight of God, see how messed up our condition is, and then leave and forget what manner of man or woman we are because we don't intend on making any changes to our condition. If you want to be saved, if you now recognize your condition, if you are poor in spirit, you don't have to wait until Sunday to make a change. If you are poor in spirit and you see your condition and you see that your life is messed up and you see that you need God, you, that is a wonderful thing. We can take you and baptize you in Jesus' name so God wash your sins away and God will fill you with the Holy Ghost if you intend on being a doer of the word that you have now heard. And this is all we try to get people to do. We try to encourage them to do it. Do what? Do the works. And we call it works uh, in a sense. Uh, but do what is necessary to receive the salvation of your soul. We're, we're getting ready to put a baptism pool in jail because we want to do what is necessary. Men want to do what is necessary to get their soul saved. If we tell them that baptism, through baptism, in Jesus' name, God washes all your sins away. And men and women that see themselves, that understand that you mean to tell me I can get a brand new start absolutely they are now ready there's about 15 of them now ready to be baptized in Jesus name ready when you see when you see yourself and you see that there is a remedy for your condition that God not only wants to wash your sins away but he wants to comfort you he wants to give you the comforter. You can do that. <laughs> can we say amen? You don't have to just hear it. And it doesn't have to. It, it can be more than just uh, words that sound good. You know how people say it sounds good to me. It can be more than that which just sounds good. You can actually do it. And if you do it, God will do it. But don't be like the scripture says, a forgetful here that sees himself and then leaves and goes his way. Remember, you see, and goeth his way. Remember, let the wicked forsake his way. He sees himself, but he goes right back to his way and forgetteth what manner of man he is and forget how I look in the sight of God. Don't wait because it could be too late. Verse 25, but whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, that is salvation, and continue it therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the word, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Uh, is not, are not the Beatitudes, did not Jesus say, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are they that mourn, blessed are the meek, blessed are those that hunger and thirst after righteousness, they are blessed because they are doing something about their condition. And the scripture says here, if you look into the perfect law of liberty that has to do with salvation and you are saved and you continue therein, you will be blessed. God wants to bless you, but you've got to change. Can we say amen? Amen. God bless you. All right, we'll go ahead and close it out on, on that note. And... Um, we appreciate your attention. We thank God for you, for your attention on tonight. We can prepare to take our offering if uh, uh, Sister uh, Erica can help us with our offering, please, very kindly. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to ask if Brother Aaron Johnson if you could uh, turn off the stream on the iPad back there. Uh, I appreciate it. I think it's just a red button that just says stop, uh, I think, or you may have to slide to stop. Amen. We thank the Lord, and again, we are... Uh, going to be helping Deacon Marcellus move on tomorrow. Uh, and he asked that we be there at 10 o'clock. Uh, 